1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're back in this passage. Uh, we looked at it the last time on the 3rd of June, and then I was out the following week, and Brother Norman Hare did such a splendid job teaching on unity from Ephesians 4. Uh, last week, we challenged our husbands and dads to be men of God. We're back in this passage, and I'm thinking summer is a challenging time to go through a series because there are inevitably uh, scheduled challenges. So next week, God willing, we're going to continue moving through this. I want to, I want to keep, this is a critical portion of this portion in chapters 12 through 14, uh, where Paul has said, I want to talk to you concerning uh, spiritual gifts. We said to you that we want, we want to have an informed understanding. There's a lot of stuff uh, that doesn't really pass muster when it comes to passages like this. There are people who just virtually shut down on this passage. They just hardly don't want to have anything to do with it. There are others that, that make this the warp and woof of Scripture. God being our helper, I want us to see this in context because a church that's not aware of the charismata, of the giftedness of God that, that is there when he gives the new birth in your heart, when he new birthed you, caused you to be born again, there was implanted in you the charismata, various ones of these. I would remind you that, uh, that our bulletin has on its face, and it will have on its face. Go to that graphic, if you will, please, Doug. This is where various grace gifts, that's the meaning of, of charismata, are listed. I told you at the time, no two lists are exactly alike. The most comprehensive list is found in 1 Corinthians 12. I told you also, if you'll pay attention, where, the, where you see pro, uh, italicized words, you're seeing uh, terms that have been previously used in a different passage. But a church that's not aware of this, individuals in a congregation who are not aware of this, who have not earnestly asked and prayed and sought for God to, to cultivate in you the gifts that are there, not give you gifts that are not cultivate in you gifts that are there, then as a church that is, that is semi-dormant, it's not a church uh, moving forward, it's not a church advancing, it's not a, it's not a vibrant church, it's not an energetic church, it's not going to be a growing church numerically or spiritually. It's going to be a church where the, where the mentality is sit, soak, and sour. We don't want to be that church. So we're going through this, not only because this is where it falls in our study through, through 1 Corinthians, this, this message Paul uh, sent, this letter he sent to the church at Corinth, uh, talking about this perfect gospel for them who, when you, when you consider his concerns, were a very imperfect church. This is something that we need to understand what he was teaching them and pray God teach us. Stir us, as we just sang, stir your church. Light your church on fire. Remember Jesus said that upon the rock of the testimony of faith given by Peter at Caesarea Philippi, confessing Jesus as Lord, that the church would be built and hell's gates would not stand against it. But dear people, hell's gates have nothing to fear when the church is not aggressively advancing. Let's look at this passage today. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, well, zero down. I'll give you a, just a brief snapshot of where we've been in, in verses 1 to 7 because it's been a while. And then get down into 8, 9, 10, and 11, God willing. Uh, then next week, continue plowing in these verses. Stand with me if you would. I hope you found 1 Corinthians 12 in your Bibles. If not, we have the text on the screen for you. We believe that the more you intentionally engage yourself with the Word, the more meaningful the Word will be to you. Follow along as I read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed 
And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. I want you to notice the Trinitarian emphasis here. Varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, referencing Jesus there. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us today, help us to… My my desire has been that he just, as we study, you just begin to get provoked and stirred and say, Lord, I I, I believe, I see this, help help me to cultivate it, God. Lord, show me, because I don't don't believe any believer was just given one… Gift. I give you given clusters for the common good of the body of Christ, for building up the body of Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we showed you the graphic. Thank you, Doug, for, for pulling that up. Remember, Paul uses these two terms the pneumatica, uh, the spiritual, and then the charismata, the, the grace gifts. We talked about that. We told you that when you look at this, this body to get this chapters 12, 13, and 14, which is a section, chapter 12 contains the, the general survey of spiritual gifts, emphasizing their common origin, their remarkable diversity, and their, their one great purpose. Chapter 13 sets forth the practice of love as the most excellent way. It's a great passage to read at a wedding because it is the biblical definition of love, but that's not why it was written. It was written to show how how believers live together in harmony, the more excellent way, Paul calls it. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 25, he deals specifically with the gift of tongues, contrasting it with the gift of prophecy and showing the superiority of the latter. He closes chapter 14 with general directions concerning the conduct of church worship. That's what we're looking at. We've already uh, looked at portions of chapter 12, the test of speaking in the Spirit, verses 1 to 3. We're going to look, God willing, uh, beginning next week or week beyond, at the illustration of the body that he uses. Today, looking at this diversity of spiritual gifts, verses uh, now 8, 9, 10, and 11. And so I want us to think about what we're seeing here and we'll see more of, there's diversity in unity. Unity and diversity. Brother Norman dealt with that marvelously a couple of Sunday mornings ago when he looked at the ones in chapter chapter 4 of Ephesians. Unity. Not, not Not uniformity. Unity. Various variegated, if you know what the word variegated means, if you, if you have variegated thread, if you've ever done a tapestry, and on the, on the top there's this pattern of different forms and colors. Look on the bottom, it looks like a mess, looks like chaos. <laughs> variegated. That's what we're, we're put together as a body. We're not alike, thank God. Viva la difference. The dominant thought is unity in the midst of diversity. He's affirmed diversity, verses 4 to 7. We talked about these, this word varieties, remember? Varieties of gifts, verse 4. Varieties of service, verse 5. Varieties of activities. It's a, the word variety means apportionment or, or distribution, allotments, if you please. Uh, differences. Varieties of gifts in verse 4. The charismata is the word there. The grace gifts. Uh, varieties of service in verse 5. That's the word diakonia. You hear, you hear the word deacon in that, but it, really, it means service. 
varieties of activities. That's the word energemata. Uh, you hear energy in that, right? Activities. The term gifts calls attention to the quality and grounds of these things. Uh, they're free. And they're the free bounty of God. You don't get them for human effort. No, no person bestows them on you from God. The idea of service emphasizes their purpose, how they're to be used. We say here that if we've joined this congregation, that we have done so, we are followers of Jesus Christ, called to love God, to love others, and to serve the world. So these gifts provide the way to serve. Activities points to the power operative, the, the energy, the divine energy implanted in the new birth. Same Spirit, same Lord, same God. So Paul's saying here, the church is at its best when it's aware of and practicing and engaged in the, the expression of the charismata, the spiritual gifts for the common good given by the triune God. Just as salvation comes from the triune God. There's abundant variety in the midst of this profound unity of the body. And because they come from God, they're sourced in God, as we sing, come thou fount of every blessing. It all comes from God. Romans 11 says, for of him, through him, unto him are all things. Then no one should ever seek an occasion to call attention to themselves in the charismata. There should never be an occasion for rivalry, for jealousy, for discontent, for feelings of inferiority or feelings of superiority, if you understand the source. That's what we looked at. So let's look at today, diversity explained in verses 8 to 10. Paul says, for, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. Notice these ninefold expressions here. The utterance of, the, of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Ninefold expressions of spiritual giftedness. He's saying this is how diversity works. This is, you know, in a body, you don't make a lot about how, how you're different. Well, I, well, I'm different. My needs are different. No, that's not, you, that's, that's complete miss. I told you before, over and over, what about me? What about me, that question? Find that in the scriptures for me, please. It is not there. Not there. So let's look at these. Some, some people have tried to divide them into categories. I, just, I'll give you a couple of examples. I don't think they're hard and fast here. One, like verse 8, speaks of gifts associated with intellect. You're going to see mind, emotions, and will in this categorical. Uh, verses 9, part of verse 10, gifts related to the will. And then in verse 10, gifts associated with the feelings or emotions. As some people have tried to divide them up that way. Others have suggested five divisions. First, gifts having to do with intellectual power, the utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge. Secondly, gifts expressing miraculous power, faith, healings, miracles. Third, gifts that are related to teaching power, prophecy. Fourth, gifts that pertain to critical power, distinguishing between spirits and those that have to do with ecstatic powers, various kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Just let you see, I don't, I don't subscribe to those, but people have thoughtfully wrestled with how to how to understand these. Let's look at the first one, utterance of wisdom. You hear people say, well, I have a word of wisdom. What is this utterance of wisdom? In the New Testament, wisdom is most often used of the ability to understand God's word and his will and to skillfully apply that understanding to life. We joked before 
and working in camp settings with young people, we would ask, and we have any sophomores here? You don't raise your hand. We have any sophomores here? Well, the, the word sophomore is from two words, sof, sophos or sophia, which is, means wise, and moros, which means moron. And, and a sophomore is, in, in, is a wise moron. And I'm not being harmful. I mean, I'm just saying that's what the word literally means. That's where it comes from. Well, when you have biblical wisdom, you, you, you're released from the moron category, right? In fact, this idea of, of wisdom seems to be something you can ask of God. Look at James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. You've heard the adage, better to uh, keep your mouth closed and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubts. So a lot of that that happens on Facebook, social media. What do you do? Well, you lack wisdom? Say, preacher, I feel unwise. Ask of God. If you belong to Jesus Christ, if you've been saved by grace through faith, the scripture says ask. So it's, it's the utterance of wisdom. There's, there's this wisdom that God gives James goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? See, so you pick up this idea that, that, that wisdom has the aspect of understanding. It's also practical application. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Wisdom acts. We'll look at knowledge in a minute. Knowledge may take in and communicate. Wisdom acts. James 3, 17, but the wisdom from above, because there is a worldly wisdom. If you're familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, you know, one of those rascally characters was Mr. Worldly Wise Man who sent Pilgrim down the absolute wrong path. Almost did him in. Wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Notice, notice the marks of wisdom. Gentle. Open to reason full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, sincere. Utterance of wisdom. It's a speaking gift because utterance has about it that you would communicate these things. Well, utterance of knowledge. It's interesting to me that Paul puts them in the order he does, but he does so by divine inspiration of the Spirit. Utterance of knowledge is the gift of communicating knowledge. It may speak of the ability to expound Christian truth. You hear people say, I have a word of knowledge. When that happens, it better correspond to the Scripture. What you're going to see as we get through this area and we jump into chapter 13 in, in the near future and we realize that... <laughs> that the completion of the Scripture has a tremendous impact upon the charismata. We're going to show you how some of these things transform, these gifts transform. And when we get into chapter 14, where Paul basically just burrows down on prophecy and tongues, not contrasting them, and tongue. Go ahead and if you want to read ahead, read through chapter 14. We're not going to be there for a few weeks. Read through chapter 14. And see how Paul uses the word tongue and tongues and the distinction he makes there. That's the key to understanding these, this, the remarkable gifts and to seeing how Paul stands on them. In the first century, word of knowledge was revelatory. The scripture was being written. Today, with the scripture complete, it's the ability to understand and speak God's truth with insight into the mysteries. You, when you read through the scripture, you find this, Paul using this word mystery. It's just the word, it's mysterion in the Greek, and we just brought it over in the English. It's not translated in mystery. What it means is something that was previously hidden that has been revealed. There should be insight into the mysteries of the word. It cannot be known apart from God's revelation. Just look at a couple of places here in Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, 2, Paul says, in order that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding. Look at that, he's loading up the language here. 
and the knowledge of God's mystery. The knowledge there, this utterance of knowledge, which is Christ. Another, another key we're going to use going through these things. If somebody's making a lot about themselves, making a lot about the Spirit, making a lot about experiences, and not making a lot about Christ, I don't care how sincere they are, they're not practicing the charismata. Christ is enough for me, we say. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 2. Again, we go, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith, so it's to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. So he's talking about this. If I have all knowledge, if I, if I have been taught and brought to understand and explain the mysteries. One writer said, knowledge majors on grasping the meaning of truth. Wisdom emphasizes the practical conviction and, co and conduct that applies it. One commentator said, it, it's the dis discourse, in other words, the communication, not the wisdom or knowledge behind it. That is the spiritual gift, for it is this that is of direct service to the church. Remember, it's all for the common good. It's the capacity. Look, if you don't, if you don't sense that you have this, that's not a sin. But I'll tell you what is a sin. It's putting pastors in roles of teaching and preaching that cannot communicate these mysteries, that don't understand biblical knowledge. Just, just because someone has the capacity to, to store up knowledge... To communicate and apply. Teachers should not be teaching who cannot understand, communicate, and make application to themselves and to others. Colleges are full of people like that. Talking heads. What Paul values is wisdom and knowledge communicated, that is spoken for the common good of the church. Then you have the third one is faith. Now, when he says faith here, this cannot be saving faith. Every believer has saving faith. When you were saved, here's what happened. Whether you were aware of it then, aware of it now or not. When you were saved, the Spirit of God came. He took the gospel that had been shared with you and shown to you, however often or how infrequently, he took that truth set before you like light into a blind man's eyes and he opened your heart. The Lord opened Lydia's heart, remember? She was a God-fearer, but she wasn't a follower of Christ. And when Paul spoke to her down by that riverside, he opened her heart so that she would receive the things. When you were saved, you were enabled in the new birth to repent of your sin, to be sorry for your sin, and to hate it and forsake it because you became keenly aware that your sin was an affront to God. It displeased God. So it enabled you to repent. Enable you to believe, to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God. He came and lived the life you were commanded to live and did not. He died the death that you should have died. He bore God's wrath as he bore your sin on the tree. He rose from the grave. You were enabled to repent of your sin and believe the gospel. You were brought from death to life. And everyone that's been saved, been enabled to believe. So this faith here is not saving faith. It's in the category of a wonder-working faith. I call your attention again to 1 Corinthians 13, 2, where Paul speaks to that. Look down in the middle. And if I have all faith, the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 17, why couldn't we do this? Verse 20, he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. He took there the smallest, someone has likened it to a little coriander seed, the smallest seed they knew of in their day. It would be today like us saying, if you have faith the size of a subatomic particle, we would be, we'd be pressing the, the, the smallest thing your mind can grasp. If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Gift of faith. 
People with the gift of faith are known to persevere in, in prayer. Someone tells them, would you pray for me about this? And, and you may see them a month later, six months later, five years later. I'm, I'm pleading with the Lord. Other people, you say, and, and, and they would say, oh, I forgot about that. That's not the gift of faith. George Mueller had the gift of faith. He believed God would provide, and God, if you know the story of George Mueller, it is humbling, it is rebuking, it is, it is inspiring. It's a spiritual gift. All oh, the congregation needs people like that. Believing. We, we got enough negative ninnies. I don't know. I tell you. It's like the person, good morning, yeah, but it could rain. That's, that's not the gift of faith. The gift of faith is not the grinning idiot either. Well, just praise the Lord anyway. And that's not it either. It's the confidence that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that we know how to ask or think according to the power that is at work in us and through us because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, and it's a focused confidence. You need people like that. You need people. It's a gift of God. Then you have miraculous power, the fourth one. These, these miraculous powers, we're only going to start this today, but this is critical. Because there are people going around who are claiming that this is, this is what they have. It's a temporary sign gift, one writer said. It was for the working of divine acts contrary to nature. So that there was no explanation for the action except that it was by the power of God. It was to authenticate, think about this, to authenticate the gospel of Christ. What was Jesus' first miracle? Do you remember? You, you, you had it referenced for you a couple of Sunday nights ago as Joshua took you through John. Jesus performed his first miracle in chapter 2, verse 11, at the wedding feast in Cana. Notice what the verse says. This, the first of Jesus' signs, he did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Jesus did that over and over. In fact, the apostles did not do this so much. You never have the apostles turning water into wine. You never have the apostles in a, in, a, in a boat on a raging sea saying, stop, be still. It's to authenticate the gospel in an area where they had never heard of the gospel. That plays into an understanding of spiritual giftedness. When you have nothing to communicate with it, put in their form of communication, then power is what gets their attention. Power. And these, uh, these uh, miraculous powers. Now, and I told you when we went through the Gospel of Mark that when Jesus healed the paralytic, the fellow who was on a mat, dropped down through the roof right in the middle of the courtyard where he was teaching, that Jesus shows us, if we'll, if we'll let him, if we'll hear it, if we'll receive it, he shows us why he performs miracles. And it, it should be the measure of that throughout the scripture and in today's life. Listen to him here. Chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. Which is easier? Because he had just said, remember, when they dropped the mat down and the guys are hanging over the roof hoping that Jesus, whom they've heard can heal, will heal their friend. He said, your sins are forgiven. Well, that's nice to hear, but that's not why they were there. And so he says, and of course they begin to whisper, who, who can forgive sins but God? This guy's a blasphemer. He said, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, that what I just said to him is true. He looked at the paralytic and said, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Jesus did miracles to authenticate that by God, he had the power to forgive sins, the authority of the gospel. And Paul did it too, and Peter did it too. And these fellows that rent these big stadiums for their healing crusades, because, quote, they have miraculous, powerful gifts, Gifts of healing, we'll get into that next week, Lord willing. Say, come. I've offered this, never been taken up. I promise you, I will pay that man's round trip ticket to St. Jude's in Memphis, Tennessee, if that's what it's about. 
simply showing power. In fact, I believe I could raise enough money from Christians I know that we could send that fellow to every trauma center, every cancer hospital, every pediatric in the country if that's what it's about. But what if it's about showing that Jesus Christ has the authority and the power to forgive sin? Well, these fellows will be in business, number one. Because when they go places, there's not enough gospel spoken by them that if you fell face forward into it, you'd be in any danger of drowning in it. Let the gifts speak for themselves and get out of your mind, your hearing, your thought process that there's any other reason for miraculous powers and as we, as we look next week, God willing, for the healing gifts than to glorify God to authenticate a beachhead for the gospel where it's not been. It's my challenge. Paul wants the Corinthians, who are abusing stuff left and right, <laughs> he wants them to understand this is what it's about. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will see. I'll give you a quick taste, and I'm going to be quiet, I promise. We will see next week in Acts, pardon me, in Revelation Chapter 19, verse 10, I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. Fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God, not worship any ministry, not give a generous gift, wrap your prayer concerns uh, in a $20 bill and send it. No, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of every one of the charismata. And if he doesn't come up forefront, then what these fellows have taught about it, whatever they have allegedly done about it, with it, I wouldn't give you a nickel for it. Because it does not fit Paul's concern. When he said to the Corinthians, when he began this letter, when I was among you, I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he hadn't left that yet. By the way, he never did. Even on the day he died. He never did. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to these passages, and Father, we, we want this church to be brought to a level of life that we have never known before as we are, as we are filled with your Spirit, as we are uh, energized by the charismata to love you and to love others to serve one another and to serve the world, to build up the body. And Father, we realize we're navigating this in the buckle of the belt of the wrong teaching about this. So help us to stay focused on Jesus Christ. Ask ourselves, is this, is this, this is the spirit of this gift magnifying Jesus? Help us, Lord. Teach us. Enliven us. Energize us. Instruct us. That we might have a right understanding of the charismata. And a manifestation that we've never known as a congregation before. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this morning. Uh, as we stand and sing, if you would like to make application for membership in our church,